Committee to Protect Journalists was formed a little more than 25 years ago. Reporters, particularly in, in many countries overseas, did not have the kind of press freedoms that we enjoy in the United States. And um, there was no one speaking up for them. I don't think this is the business of a journalist. Forgive me for correcting you, but it is absolutely the business of a journalist. There was a specific case that led to the creation of CPJ, and it involved a Paraguayan journalist named Alcibiades Gonzalez del Valle. While he was in the United States, he learned that because of his critical commentary, he, he was a columnist, that he was going to be arrested when he went home to Paraguay. And he went around and started telling people, look, I'm going to be arrested when I go home, told his colleagues in the American media, is there anything that you can do? And Michael Massing, who was at that time the um, uh, um, editor of the Columbia Journalism Review, and his colleague Lori Nadell, um, realized there was no organization that could help him. He and some colleagues got together and created an organization that, um, uh, whose mission was to try to speak out whenever um, uh, journalists came under um, uh, persecution. So they started calling around to their colleagues and saying, we've got this journalist, he's going back to Paraguay. If anything happens to him, we've got to cover this. And he went back to Paraguay. Initially, he was not arrested, but the next day he was basically you know, tackled in the street and put in a taxi cab and taken away. And immediately, there was a flurry of coverage. Strassner dictatorship backed down and released him. And from that one event, an idea, a model was born. We, as American journalists, work from a very privileged position. We have legal protections. We've got the First Amendment. We've got a vital press. But in much of the world, um, places where there's violence and conflict and impunity, the most basic kind of nuts and bolts reporting can get you killed. And that's what CPJ was set up to combat. So, so we're using, in a certain sense, we're using the power of the American media and of the global Western media to come to the defense of our colleagues around the world who don't have those protections. The day after 9-11, Danny and I flew to Pakistan. Obviously, 9-11 was a cataclysm for many, 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 many people as a result of, of the collapse of the towers, which pushed tons and tons and tons of debris into our building. We were unable to get back to our building. In the middle of that, we learned that uh, Danny had been kidnapped. Excuse me, how, how far are we going? American journalists, when they go to work in the morning, regardless of you know, what media you work in, uh, you don't really worry about not coming home. Most of the journalists who come here they come with only one story they want to write, and that is they want to write about terrorism. Is that what you want? Honestly, I don't, I, I can't tell you that until I, until I meet him. I, mean, I don't know that until I meet him. Danny represented the very best of journalism. And his killing, um, his horrific murder, shocked the conscience of the world. Well, the Wall Street Journal reporter who's been missing for 10 days. The demands that the kidnappers have placed are not demands that calling itself the national movement for the restoration of Pakistani sovereign. The president helped, the secretary of state helped, the FBI um, was involved from the get-go and they worked with the Pakistani investigators on a collaborative basis. We should work together. I would not like to have it any other way, Mrs. Swerd. I need your support, I need your help. The CIA, which to my knowledge never does this sort of thing, came out and made a statement that he had never been a CIA agent or any kind of government agent. Says that Denny is suspected of being a Mossad agent and of having relation with India's intelligence agency. In any war, journalists like soldiers get wounded and killed. But what is happening now more and more is that journalists are being specifically targeted for their work. If you talk to longtime war correspondents, they will describe the day not that long ago, certainly in Vietnam, for example, when 
you would wave a press pass in the air and that would get you through a checkpoint or that would get you to talk to just about anyone. Um, why did people talk to journalists in war zones? Because if you wanted to get your information out to the world, your message out to the world, you had to go through journalists. You had to go through the media. Journalists could say, I'm here to document. I'm not here to judge. Tell me, give, tell me your message and I will you know, put it in the newspaper or put it on TV. Nowadays, that ain't going to work. He has a gun to his head and he's smiling and he's telling me he's okay. I would don't know what kinds of conversations were going on when Danny Pearl was in the uh, was being held by his kidnappers but I imagine at some point he made that argument you guys have a point of view release me and let me tell the story these groups have other means of communicating they can communicate through the internet but the message they wanted to send was a very different message it was a message of terror and violence and fear and the best way for them to send that message was not by talking to Danny Pearl, but by killing him. Their point is, is to, to terrorize people, right? I am not terrorized. You know, one of the few positive things that could come out of that, I hope, is that it raises awareness about the circumstances in which those journalists work day in and day out. It's still relatively rare that foreign, a foreign journalist would be targeted for murder in this way. but. They have advantages that local journalists never had. They can leave if they feel it's getting too dangerous. They generally have large media organizations behind them. They have often powerful governments that will speak up if something happens to them. In Iraq, it could not be more clear that the information chain starts with Iraqi journalists. They're the ones who are going out there on the street. They're the ones who are collecting the information. They're the ones who are documenting the violence. They're the ones whose pictures, if you look at photo credits in newspapers, those are Iraqi journalists who are getting out there and taking those pictures. Um, we owe them, as news consumers, an enormous debt of gratitude. And they're getting killed. Over the last um, 15 years, um, nearly 500 journalists uh, have been killed and 85% of those journalists have been killed with impunity. Impunity is a word that you hear from us more and more. It's very rare that the killers of journalists are brought to justice. Which means that there is no threat of sanction to cause people not to use these um, horrible methods again. Seven journalists have been killed, murdered, in Pakistan since Danny Pearl's killing. The lesson for me is you had the Pakistani government and certain heroic individuals put everything they had into apprehending uh, the perpetrators of this crime. That is really rare. And it happens when governments are under pressure. And that's our job, to make sure that they feel that kind of pressure and that they feel compelled to carry out vigorous investigations.